This week on the For Virginia podcast, Trump makes unfounded accusations of voter fraud in Virginia. We update you on the 2017 election cycle. And Charlottesville Vice Mayor Bellamy is out at the State Board of Elections after offensive tweets are found on his Twitter history. This and the rest of your weekly news roundup coming now. Thanks and welcome to the For Virginia podcast for the week ending December 3rd. This is show number 15. I'm your host, Michael Brandon Wade. Thanks for tuning in. For Virginia is a state political action committee focused on supporting progressive causes and candidates at the local and state level. Our weekly podcast is meant to provide you with news and analysis of politics across the state, helping you get the information you need to be an informed citizen, battle right wing propaganda and help progressives organize and activate where we are most needed. We usually kick off the show with a recap of updates to previous news. Regular listeners of the podcast will know that Alpha Natural Resources is one of our nemesis. Nemeses? Anyways, we don't like them very much. I'll just leave it at that. They are a coal company who are have been in bankruptcy negotiations following several thousand worker layoffs they tried to get approval for $12.9 million in executive performance bonuses. Um, After they came out of bankruptcy protection, we reported last week that they suddenly came up with a hundred million dollars in unaccounted for expenses that basically were tied to their responsibilities to clean up closed mines. After some negotiations with their, partner in crime, Contura Energy, they have uh, apparently resolved the issue. Now, the the way this works is that the coal industry is dying, obviously. And so what they do is they split off the assets to one company, which in this case is Contura that has actual mineral rights. And then the other goes to the black sheep, which is basically has to pay for all the cleanups and, and gets all the liabilities, worker pensions and so forth. So Alpha and Contura are the two in that, that particular shell game there. Alpha went bankrupt trying to resolve themselves the responsibilities. And so after they came out of bankruptcy, they said, oh, hey, we've got $100 million in responsibilities we didn't tell you about. Um, so they've apparently restructured that a little bit or whatever. And... They were about to get sued by West Virginia. Um, Alpha is also involved in uh, Virginia politics. They contributed several million dollars to general assemblymen and women possibly over the past uh, 15 years or so. Anyways, anyways, we talk about them a lot. Alpha Natural Resources, name to know. Written a lot about it on, on the subject as well. So keeping you informed on that. Moving on to budget news. Governor McAuliffe is upbeat after announcing that they are making progress on a budget for next year. Virginia, of course, has a balanced budget amendment and latest last projections were a $1.6 billion budget shortfall. Um, Virginia does their budget every two years, just FYI. So the past uh, $861 million for 2016 and 2017, a projected gap of about $654 million for 2018. That's down to about $1.5 billion, give or take a few million. Most of the shortfall is because payroll and sales tax receipts have been lower than expected. So um, we've talked about payroll taxes in Virginia cap at about $17,500. So once you get more than, once you make more than that, you're at the same tax level rate, which um, some people are going to correct me on this, I'm sure. I think it's about 5.3%, which is pretty low. I mean, it's right in line with North Carolina, but when you think about, uh, you know, what you're paying in federal taxes, obviously that's pretty low. Uh, sales tax receipts, um, lower than expected. I'm going to guess Amazon and uh, online shopping has a lot to do with that. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation in my neck of the woods about local shopping centers closing, uh, local businesses failing, uh, or just not renewing their leases and closing, people retiring. Uh, a lot of it probably has to do with young people not getting involved with that process. We'll talk more about that. It's a general theme um, of the show. 
One thing I did note, uh, according to the Washington Post, the governor meets with his advisory council on revenue estimates. This the group advises governors on revenue projections and meets in private so the business executives can share internal metrics and expectations about hiring and other strategies. Uh, if you're interested in government transparency, that's probably going to be a little bit uh, con- controversial. Uh, follow up to our main story from two weeks ago about the Virginia Economic Development Partnership. That is a agency that is in charge of bringing jobs to Virginia. They usually make some kind of tax deal um, or other incentive with a agency in order, or excuse me, with a business in order to bring jobs into the state. Um, anytime you see one of those headlines, it says company X brings certain number of jobs to certain town usually has something to do with it, whether it's the uh, VEDP or local business leaders getting involved with that. And the controversy two weeks ago was that there's no accountability. Nobody is checking to see whether or not these promises that are made to bring jobs into the area are actually being met and, uh, you know, penalizing or adjusting the, the incentives accordingly. So what has happened is that, the board of directors has hired its new president and CEO, Stephen Moore, who's the former secretary of the Louisiana Department of Economic Development. That is a post from uh, Jindal, Bobby Jindal, governor of, of Louisiana. So I'm sure a lot of people will be um, going through and looking at the results of his tenure in Louisiana to see what kind of effect he had over there in order to hopefully – turn around Virginia. We'll see. And the state police keep continue to have problems. Starting salaries just over $36,000, which is below Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania and Stafford County. For example, they're getting hit by the budget, Virginia state budget woes as well. 250 vacancies, including 146 positions for sworn officers. They lost 118 from January to October of this year. And I'm sorry, lost 137, replaced 118. So they are downhill. State police obviously aren't going to go away anytime soon, but we're going to see less of them on the road. Um, I saw another article today that stated that the uh, you see these signs on some of the, the highways down here in Hampton Roads. I'm not sure you know Arlington or Richmond have them, but these speed enforced by aircraft signs, not so much anymore. Uh, the signs will probably be there for a while, but the uh, the aircraft won't be. So keep that in mind next time you're driving and uh, get pulled over by a state trooper. You might want to watch out and give him some respect. Oh, and one quick note I left out about the uh, Virginia Economic Development Partnership. The uh, incoming CEO from Louisiana is actually going to make $340,000 a year, which is 11% more than the last guy that left the job. Um, yeah, just keep that in mind. I actually saw um, several members of the development partnership at the chamber event in Williamsburg this Thursday. I'll probably talk a little bit about that later. But uh, I did I did manage to corner one during one of the breaks and and kind of give it to him. So uh, <laughs> I actually gave him a button, told him to check out the podcast because I I said I said. Uh, you guys haven't been getting any good press lately, actually. <laughs> so not sure he uh, he enjoyed that conversation or not, but um, I did. And um, I guess this is actually n- new news, but um, we've been talking about Petersburg a lot, and especially with their budget woes. Um, the ACLU, the Virginia chapter of the ACLU, uh, has sent a strongly worded letter to Petersburg City Council over the council's practice of holding closed meetings and special meetings on short notice in inconvenient locations. Uh, They find this to be inconsistent with the spirit of the uh, Freedom of Information Act. Quote, when a meeting is scheduled and announced as a closed meeting, it has a result of suppressing interest in attending and participating. Members of the media and the public may decide not to attend a meeting announced as including a closed session because there may be a significant portion of the meeting that they will be unable to attend or hear. Um, These have to do with uh, these meetings in the past have dealt with uh, pay cuts for city workers. And uh, apparently the ACLU has sued 
Petersburg in the past over open government issues. No plans at this point to do so, uh, but we'll keep you informed if anything changes on that front. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. I'll be right back with Four Virginia Podcast. Stay tuned. This is Michael Brennan Wade. As always, we'd like to ask that you go to our website at fourvirginia.org where we'll be posting show notes with links to all the sources that we reference in the show. Please share this podcast on social media, follow us on Facebook, and help us get the word out. We'd also like to hear any feedback that you have for us on how we can better serve. Please comment on the video, email info at fourvirginia.org or contact us on Facebook if you're interested in helping the progressive revolution in Virginia. And if you like what you're doing and like to support us, please head on over to our Act Blue page and make a donation. Uh, we've got buttons for sale for $5 if you'd like one of our birdie logos that we made for the DPVA convention last summer. And uh, thanks again for all your support. Moving on to new news. Richmond Times Dispatch reports that 13 Black Lives Matter protesters were sentenced to five days in jail for blocking Richmond Interstate back in July. The judge seems like he was pretty lenient in this case, allowing one woman a delay because of uh, college exams. Uh, Richmond's assistant Commonwealth attorney, Davis Powell, the prosecutor in cases, say that they put themselves in danger, they put other people in danger. So we thought that five days in jail was an appropriate punishment. I know a lot of consternation from uh, White Lives Matter types, uh, at least on my neck of uh, social media. Of course, there never is a convenient protest. Speaking of which, the Cavalier Daily, UVA's student newspaper, reports that students stormed a board of visitors meeting with demands. We've previously reported about faculty letters and, and other actions that are being taken at the university about Thomas Jefferson in general and his uh, racist past and so forth. Personally, I'm a little conflicted on that. But the uh, 25 students marched into a board of visitors meeting Friday with a list of verbal demands asking the university to do more to create, quote, safe space for victims of hate crimes. Protesters took turns going around the room before the rector of the university, William Goodwin, asked him to leave. Quote, we demand the end of idolizing slave owners to acknowledge the perpetrators of racism, and we demand making this university a safe space for all victims of hate crimes. And last bit of protest news. Three protesters who held a demonstration at the downtown Roanoke office of U.S. Rep. Bob Goodlatte were convicted on trespassing charges. The Reverend David Denham and Lunsby Denham and Angela Yarborough were charged November 1st after they conducted a three-hour sit-in. Their goal had been to encourage Goodlatte, who heads the House Judiciary Committee, to schedule hearings on five voting rights and campaign finance bills. Goodlatte was not at his office. On the day of the incident, representatives from a movement called Democracy Spring appeared at all five of Goodlatte's district offices, urged hearings on bills that would facilitate voter registration, and set limits on campaign spending. Only the Roanoke demonstration resulted in criminal charges. And apparently, according to one of the Denims, uh, he has still not responded. We have people, in, quote, we have people in this election that weren't able to vote because of, frankly, his stubbornness. And a little bit of automotive news for you. Uh, Electric car company Tesla has won a court battle over its second Virginia store. A little bit of background here. So state law currently prohibits car manufacturers from operating dealerships in the state unless it can show that there are no dealers that can do the job. The The reason for this law was originally to prevent manufacturers from undercutting independent dealers who, you know, traditionally count on service fees for, you know, automotive repairs and markups over dealer pricing in order to provide for the pricing. So Tesla opened their first store in 2012, I believe. They have a direct to consumer model. They have cars that don't require a lot of repairs because they don't have 
an engine or a combustible engine that has moving parts and so forth. So the dealership association has been really fighting uh, for the second store against the second store. And the court has ruled in favor of it. 11 dealers did uh, express interest in opening a dealership, but Tesla dismissed those um, as orchestrated by the dealer association, not an a serious expression of interest. Um, the five dealers actually testified during the hearing, but uh, the judge in the case said that none of them had created business plans or indicated that they were capable of servicing the vehicles. And, and they argued that Tesla hadn't provided the information uh, in order to do this. So I, full disclosure, I am a Tesla share owner, not a Tesla car owner, unfortunately, but I just wanted to get that out there. And without a doubt, probably the biggest um, news scandal of the week in Virginia politics was the appointment and resignation of Charlottesville Vice Mayor Bellamy from the Virginia Board of Education. I'm sitting here reading some of the tweets right now that were reported by Jason Kessler. And uh, they're pretty bad. They're pretty bad indeed. Um calling women the C word. And and the worst part is he did it all using his official Twitter account. Wes Bell, Bellamy, M-E-D, Vice Mayor, at Vice Mayor Wes B. Um, apparently this guy's a very prolific tweeter, several dozen times a day apparently. You know, we're talking tens of thousands of uh, tweets. So, yep. Pretty uh, pretty ugly comments on the blog post and pretty ugly what happened to him. Uh, inappropriate tweets from Bellamy caused some to call for his removal. McAuliffe horrified by Board of Ed's appointees, racist, sexist, obscene tweets. Homophobic, sexist, anti-white language abundant in Charlottesville Vice Mayor's tweets. These are the, the headlines that uh, I saw. And then uh, he resigned over the tweets um, from the Education Board. And uh, a lot of people called from him to for him to resign from all of his uh, public official seats. So he's a councilman in Charlottesville, apparently, the vice mayor. Uh, just to read you from this uh, jasonkessler.net, <clears throat> quote, Vice Mayor West Bellamy has created deep divisions within the Charlottesville community by taking a largely administrative position and turning it into a bully pulpit to attack white culture and history. He recently targeted Lee Park, demanding that his historical Robert E. Lee statue be removed, despite a price tag of over $700,000 to taxpayers. But it's all about his deep-seated resentments. He doesn't care about massively overspending to get his way sick. So that was uh, that was the story of the week, apparently. I guess the uh, that was one of the, the big stories of the week from a state perspective. Um, the other being Trump's claims of voter frauds. Uh, I, I tweeted one of the links that he, he put out about voter fraud in Virginia. I'm not even going to really dignify this with a response, but um, just some of the headlines. Trump pushes conspiracy theory that, m quote, millions voted illegally for Clinton. Trump assails recount efforts says Virginia had, quote, serious voter fraud. Trump alleges massive fraud in Virginia vote, but no evidence seen. That's actually a better headline. Um, a lot of a lot of problems with the way Trump is is treated in the press and how they just spew his propaganda. I think it was CBS was one of the the guilty parties here when he said that he would have won the popular vote if uh, millions hadn't voted illegally. And you know it, it's it's just not bad to lie when the press reports your lie instead of the fact that you're lying. Um, so the daily press actually couched that with uh, no evidence seen. Richmond Times dispatch Trump claims serious voter fraud in Virginia, but state ally says no mass scale fraud reported. And the James City County, sorry, this is the WY Daily, Williamsburg, Yorktown Daily, for JCC, James City County Registrar, Trump's allegations of Virginia voter fraud is an insult to Department of Elections. So that's about all I'm going to say on that. We've we've obviously got a lot of work to do 
with uh, how we deal with the Trump administration over the next four years, recounts and faithless electors and impeachment efforts notwithstanding. Um, it's going to be a long one. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about state efforts against Trump and how we have to deal with that um, after we talk about the 2017 elections. But uh, there is there is a, a bit we need to talk about there. So we're going to take a quick short break. We'll come back with uh, the 2017 election news, and then we'll we'll get into our main story of the week. So thanks. Stay tuned. Podcast. This is Michael Brandon Wade. Uh, just to let you guys know, I've been struggling with uh, some sickness with my family, passing around colds and fevers, and uh, both my youngest daughter and my wife have had ear infections. I've been struggling with some throat issues uh, for at least a week now. The past last podcast and this podcast, I've been having a pause recording every minute or so to cough and hack and drink some water and um, suck on some lunges. But uh, I just hope you guys appreciate it. Please show me some love. Um, that's all I ask. So anyways, carrying on a uh, quick note about West Bellamy, who we were talking about uh, Charlottesville city council, vice mayor. Uh, apparently they are, there is an effort underway to remove him uh, from city council petitions going around and uh, apparently they're trying to uh, recall him. This is off of uh, Jason Kessler, K-E-S-S-L-E-R dot net. Um, visit at your own risk. You have been warned. So 2017 elections, um, you know, still in 2016, but one thing that you'll notice if you follow uh, state politics with regards to elections is that you, there definitely seems to be a process or a hierarchy, if you will. So uh, Senator John Miller passed away in Newport news um, earlier this year. So we had a state delegate move up to the Senate seat and then the delegate election to do that. Um, we're seeing the same thing elsewhere throughout the state as uh, these congressional elections have happened. So a state Senator or whoever moves into Congress, then you have a delegate fight for his Senate seat. And now the delegate seats elections as well. So there's all these special elections taking place uh, coming up in January. Uh, Governor McAuliffe has set a January 10th, Special election for McEachin, Garrett, and Taylor. Republican Normie Norman Holcomb, captain of the Virginia Beach Sheriff's Office, and Democrat Cheryl Turpin, a teacher in the city's public schools, are running in a special election for the House of Delegates seat to replace Delegate Scott Taylor, who was elected to the House of Representatives um, last November. State Senators Tom Garrett and Donald McEachin and Delegate Scott Taylor are giving up their seats. And I'm trying to find information on the other elections. Senate District 22. Two Democrats are fighting. Uh, let's see. Senate Tom Garrett's seat. Katie Webb Seifert of Lynchburg and Rant L. Washington of Palmyra. So they are going at it. And those are the specials. I don't have that third one, unfortunately. Try a little harder next time, I guess. Now, the governor's race, obviously, Lieutenant Governor Ralph Northam uh, will be the Democratic candidate. He has been busy, busy, busy. I actually saw him, shook his hand on Thursday, excuse me, Friday in Williamsburg. I was at the Williamsburg Lodge to attend a coastal policy talk uh, being held by the College of William and Mary. And uh, I got there, and there were 900 people there in attendance for the 7th Annual Virginia Chamber of Commerce Economic Development 
meeting. And uh, yeah, so uh, Northam actually spoke at both. I, I caught his speech uh, for the coastal policy speech. I might talk about that when we get to climate change here in a little bit. But uh, he's been busy. Workforce Pipeline Initiative highlighted in a roundtable with Lieutenant Governor Northam. Uh, he visited a drone program at PVCC, which is Piedmont Virginia Community College in Albemarle County. He spoke with Carillion leaders to discuss the opioid crisis. And he visited Staunton to boost his gubernatorial bid. So also at the um, chamber event that I went to were all four Republican candidates for governor. Ed Gillespie, Corey Stewart, Rob Whitman, and Frank Wagner. Uh, Rob Whitman is a senator, excuse me, a representative to the House. And uh, Wagner is a state senator. Corey Stewart is the chairman of the Prince William County Board of Supervisors. And he was also Trump's state campaign chair until October when he uh, was booted from the campaign for trying to out-Trump Trump. Uh, so basically what's happening right now between those guys is that uh, Corey Stewart is trying to beat up Ed Gillespie for criticizing Donald Trump or at least not endorsing him as much. So you remember when the uh, grabber by the you know what tapes came out that a lot of people across the state and the nation in general were, were kind of distancing themselves from Trump. And Stewart was definitely full hog on that one and uh, is beating up Gillespie. Now, I'm not a betting man, and I don't like to make predictions, but uh, what I'm reading is that if Stewart plays his cards right, he may actually get the nod because the regular establishment candidates, Whitman, and Wagner might split the vote enough uh, between themselves and Gillespie that uh, Stewart might be able to eke one out. So we'll see how that goes. Um, will definitely be interesting. There was an interesting talk by a gentleman by the name of Holcomb. He's a uh, political science professor. Um, he gave a, a very interesting speech that I'm going to try and get for you guys. Uh, I got about five minutes of, of it on my phone that is probably not worth sharing right off the top, but I'm going to contact the chamber and see if they have the speech. He, he goes in to speak directly about the House of Delegates and the way that the you know the, the state and the, the election last November and uh, talks about Northrum and, and these Republican guys and uh, doesn't really – give me much hope that Northam can pull it off, but, um, I, I am rooting for him and support him. But, uh, some of the things this poli side guy said, he's highly respected, spoke to several other elected officials who were there listening to him and, and getting their opinion. And, uh, he's, he's solid. I actually spoke to Holcomb, uh, for about five, five minutes or so after, after his speech about, some of the things we're trying to do with redistricting and taking over the house of delegates. And, um, he wasn't too, uh, encouraging, uh, but I'm not gonna let that s slow me down and hope don't want that to slow you down either, but it, it does, uh, it is important to hear counter countervailing views on that kind of thing. So I'm um, wrapping up the rest of the 2017 elections. Uh, we've got Roanoke's David Bauer moles running for Lieutenant governor. He is the four-term mayor of Roanoke. And on the other side of the aisle, Republican Reeves kicks off his bid. That is uh, State Senator Bryce Reeves running for lieutenant governor. Um, the only attorney general information, uh, obviously we got Mark Herring in there right now, uh, but... Bill State Senator Bill Stanley, a Republican from Franklin County, is thinking of the nomination since Delegate Rob Bell of Charlottesville dropped out of the running next month. So we're going to have a hard, hard fight next year. There's this thing called the Virginia curse that I'm just going to mention. I don't believe in curses or superstition or anything like that. But there, there seems to be a superstition in Virginia that whichever party wins the presidential election, the other party wins the governor's race. Um, McAuliffe actually broke it. I don't think, like I said earlier, um, 
you know, I don't give any credence to it, but we've got a lot going on this year. All of our governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general are all Democrats right now. Virginia went blue by what? 10,000 votes. We have got to have turnout going. Uh, One of the conversations I had with Holcomb that I could easily tell you guys is Mark Warner was a popular, is a popular state senator, 65% or something, I think is what what, what he told me. But even with a 65% approval rating in Congress, he barely managed to win his state, his Senate seat because of the polarization in Washington. People that liked Warner didn't vote for him because they hated Harry Reid. So the last thing we can do in 2017 is the kind of complacency or the kind of hubris or whatever you want to call it that Virginia Democrats or just Democrats across the nation did in 2016 before we lost the presidential election. So just keep that in mind. And, uh, We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. We're going to have our main story about climate change and state action in the light of a Trump presidency. And uh, we'll be right back. Stay tuned. tonight or today this afternoon whenever you're listening i usually do these saturday nights between 10 and two o'clock in the morning depending on uh, how how much preparation i do ahead of time um again i hope you enjoy these i do these uh to keep people informed and to kind of organize some things so uh, again if you if you enjoy listening to these let me know i'll keep doing these as long as i can and uh Surefire way to keep me doing them is to to share the videos, give me some likes, give me some views. And um, if you really support us, you know, want to help get involved, you can either donate some money through our Act Blue page or um, contact me directly. We try to get uh, interviews when we can with state leaders or other people who are active in the community. If you know somebody, if you'd like to be interviewed, you can contact me. If uh, you want to help with the movement, let me know. We've got a lot of allies uh, throughout social media and around the state that we work with. So looking to get people involved in the community and get involved with government and politics. Um, we need more young people standing up to fight for the things we believe in. And uh, our main story tonight, we don't really have a story. We don't have an interview tonight. So it's just uh, me. But there, there are a couple of editorials that came to my attention that I wanted to share with you. So I I was at the coastal policy center discussion at the Williamsburg lodge on Friday. And, um, you know, it's important to me because of where I live, you know, not only as a citizen of Southeastern Hampton roads, but just in general, you know, climate change is important to me because it's getting hotter and the ice caps are melting and, you know, things are, the coral reefs are dying. I don't have to tell you about that, but it's very pertinent to me as a citizen of Southeastern Virginia because of all the flooding that occurs. So Norfolk is probably the most threatened flood area on the East Coast right now. I know that in general, Hampton Roads is the most vulnerable region of the country besides New Orleans. And we all know what happened there with Katrina. I saw a speech. Uh, Secretary of State John Kerry was here at ODU uh, last year, maybe real earlier this year, maybe spring, uh, speaking about the climate impact on defense. We've got all this military bases all over the area and flooding prevents not only the movement of people you know, on and off base, but hurricanes and all that other stuff affect deployment readiness capabilities. You know, every time there's a a, a big storm here, Oceana 
not, I'm sorry, not Oceania, but the air squadrons got to take all their planes and fly, fly inland. Uh, there's a great book that I recommend. It's called Virginia Climate Fever. Virginia Climate Fever. Uh, the subheading is How Global Warming Will, Will Transform Our Cities. It's by Steve Nash. He is a reporter, I believe, with the uh, University of Virginia Library. Great book. Um, what's interesting about it, and I've, I saw Northam do this on Friday, the argument over whether climate change is man-made and all that stuff uh, is an important one. But what I've seen a lot of people do uh, is kind of shelve that argument towards the mitigation effects. Like, what do we do about the flooding? Like, the sea is lo- is rising. Their argument is that it doesn't matter what's causing the rising, but the sea is rising. What do we do about it? How are we going to deal with flooding in our areas? How are we going to deal with the effects of rising temperatures on crops, on insects, on other animals? So I don't necessarily agree that we should just discount the the cause of climate change, but until we can, I'm not really sure what the answer is, whether it's going to take a generational thing in order to do that until we get more young people that believe in climate change man-made climate change in the government? I'm not sure what the answer is. I, I believe the answer is is more more young people involvement. I mean, we're not going to argue with these people uh, that are disbelieve it because of the economic ramifications of what it means. Um, you're not going to argue with the fossil fuel companies that are dependent on oil reserves or natural gas reserves that they're causing climate change because the natural result of that truth is that their assets, their mineral rights are worthless. Naomi Klein, um, she wrote a book about this recently. I think it was called This Changes Everything, where she basically states that that's the whole reason they're fighting us. Because if you believe that man-made climate change is real, then the next extension of that is that fossil fuels have to be left in the ground. So, They've looked at what known reserves of oil and gas we have. And if we were to pump all of that into the atmosphere, burn it or use it using today's technology, you know, we'd be looking at more than four degrees Celsius of of warming, which is catastrophic. Two degrees, which we're already well on the way past, is, is, is more than damaging enough. But but we're not gonna we're not gonna convince them that they're to to do that. I mean, it's gonna take a lot of action by an entire generation of people, and maybe even the demise of an older generation. I don't know if we're gonna be able to do that in four years or even twenty before it's too late. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because the Trump presidency and the actions of the Trump administration on climate are one of the biggest fears among climate activists. And what this means is that it's going to fall, it's going to become the responsibility of the states, of the localities, of individuals at the activist and community organizational level to to get these policies, climate friendly policy, you know, environment first policies enacted. Editorial by the Fredericksburg Lance Star, Bay, Sea Level Rise, Top Virginia's Environmental List. This first paragraph of all the environmental issues facing Virginia from the mountains to the sea to the standout are the health of the Chesapeake Bay and rising sea levels in military job rich Tidewater, Virginia. They deserve an early nod of recognition by the incoming administration of President-elect Donald Trump. I don't have any hope of that happening. Northam stated in his speech to the coastal policy people that, you know, most farmers understand fertilizer runoff and are taking steps to buffer, limit 
runoff of that into the bay. I mean, the nitrogen phosphorus mix affecting the algae growth has everything to do with our fishing industries, crabbing, oysters. Um, apparently, I didn't know this, but Virginia, Southampton, Rose, or Chesapeake Bay area is, is probably the biggest economic center of oysters on the East Coast. I was not aware of that. Anyways, uh, the Fredericksburg paper goes on to hope that, quote, the new administration takes its lead from President Ronald Reagan, who in his 1984 State of the Union address called for federal funding to clean up a productive recreational area and special national resource, the Chesapeake Bay, end quote. I don't have any hope of that happening. I don't think anybody listening to this does either. And neither does Michael Town at the Richmond Times Dispatch, apparently. He says, quote, the president-elect is a climate denier, and he's placed executives of big oil companies and other climate deniers on his transition team. One of these people is Virginia's own Becky Norton Dunlop, former secretary of natural resources under Governor George Allen, who not only had to resign from the Reagan administration for replacing career staff with political appointees, but was also rebuffed in her efforts to turn state parks and state environmental protections over to private companies. Since her days wreaking havoc on Virginia's environment, Dunlop has spent most of that time working for the Inside the Beltway conservative think tank, the Heritage Foundation. Another transition team member, Mike McKenna, a current energy industry lobbyist and former director of external affairs in the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality, is infamous for helping lead DEQ when it was accused in a bipartisan legislative report of, quote, coddling to industrial polluters and neglecting to enforce water quality laws, end quote, according to the Washington Post. It is clear just from the people he's surrounding himself with, the president-elect is already pursuing an anti-environmental agenda that will attempt to tear down much of the progress we made. With an impotent environmental protection agency, core safeguards that protect the Chesapeake Bay, our drinking water, and special places like Shenandoah National Park will be under constant attack. A Trump administration will also attack the strong climate legacy of the past eight years, including President Obama's signature climate effort, the Clean Power Plan, as well as an international accord, the Paris Accord, to cut greenhouse gas emissions. So then, how do we move forward? Town continues. Strong environmental leadership at the state level is more important now than ever, and it's up to Governor Terry McAuliffe to do everything within his power to stand up to the reckless radical and irresponsible erosion of environmental protections that are sure to come with Trump. Uh, he calls on uh, exec McAuliffe to see through with executive order 57, which directs his agencies to draft a state based regulation that reduces the carbon footprint of our state's fleet of power plants. Translating to a 40% reduction in carbon emissions by 2030 and 1500 megawatts of clean solar power by 2025. I'm all for that. Uh, he goes on, Virginia re rejected Trump and his regressive policies while other important swing states went his way. In the 2008, 2012, and 2016 presidential elections, as well as the 2013 gubernatorial contest, Virginia voters have embraced candidates who have run on strong env environmental policies, including expanding renewable energy and addressing climate change. November 8 also yielded the election of the Congress of a Virginia climate champion with the victory of long term longtime state Senator Don McEachin in the 4th District. This should send a signal to anyone seeking statewide office in Virginia that a strong environmental platform matters in a state on the front lines of the climate crisis. Uh, so he, Michael is uh, Michael Town is the executive director of the Virginia League of Conservation Voters. Um, great article, Richmond Times Dispatch printed it. I'm definitely going to link that one out there <clears throat> along with this next one. My throat is going out fast, so I'm going to try and wrap this up for you guys here shortly. Appreciate you listening. The Center for Public Integrity, uh, under the heading Carbon Wars, has an article that says, With Trump's election, critical climate efforts likely fall to the state's. Um, and they have the, the drop quote there says it will be possible for states to choose to become pollution havens. Um, obviously, we're not going to let that happen in Virginia, but uh, they they start right off with Virginia talking about Norfolk flooding. They they talk about 
minor flooding. And I one statistic that they throw in here that I thought was interesting is it says that before 1980, the Norfolk area saw 20 hours a year of flooding, uh, nuisance flooding, rainy day flooding, meaning not, not a storm. Um, now that's over 200. I'm not going to read this whole article. I, I encourage you to check it out, but it does focus directly on Virginia action, the state level McAuliffe and, uh, changes to the, to the Eastern seaboard. So definitely want to check that one out. And, uh, again, that means we have to fight. We have to step up in the leadership roles and talk about climate. Um, we can't allow our local or statewide or even national figures to, to hijack this conversation, you know, claiming that, you know, Virgin America can't, can't do enough because of the Chinese or the India or anything like that. We have to do everything we can. We have to lead by example. And that includes the renewable energy, flood mitigation efforts. There's a lot of work to be done. And with a Trump administration, tearing down the EPA, tearing down climate rules, trying to destroy the Paris Accord. We need to do everything we can possibly do to step up and and take care of things. And we're going to wrap things up. Let's get into it. Shame or fame time. Here comes our shame. This week is Republican delegate Dave LaRock, who was reported this week by the Winchester Star, plans to pass a bill banning abortion after 20 weeks gestation. This is the Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act. Would have subjected physicians to a class four felony charge if they perform an abortion after 20 weeks, barring severe risk to the health or life of the mother. Apparently, he has tried to do this several times before and expects it to fail again this year as well. We give him points for persistence, but a failing grade for women's choice to control their own bodies. Our actual shame for this week goes to the state of Virginia for their plans to use a three-jug combination in the upcoming execution, scheduled execution of a man named Ricky Gray. The three drug combination that Virginia has chosen for the execution includes, I'm going to mess this up, midazolam, a drug that the state has never used before and that has been involved in botched executions elsewhere. Now, I'm not really going to get into Mr. Ricky Gray. Um, Apparently, he is a despicable human being killed a family of four, I believe. Cox High School, I believe that's Virginia Beach. Confessed to the murder. Doesn't seem to be any question of his guilt. We'll save the question of whether or not the state should be executing people at all for another day. But the pilot reports that for years, the drugs used in executions nationwide have been harder and harder for states to obtain. Drug makers do not want their names on their products or their products associated with executions and have refused to sell them to states for that purpose. And so Virginia and other states have turned to compounding pharmacies, which makes the drug and provide them to states in secret. Virginia did not have a law allowing the use of such drugs until... A law was passed in February. I think I never reported it. We weren't doing the podcast back then, but I, I have do remember seeing that. Um, McAuliffe, I'm not sure if he was overridden on that last year or not. I believe he went. Oh, yes, here it goes. So here, here's the here's where it gets tricky. So if you're on death row in Virginia, you can choose between lethal injection or the electric chair. But the state is required to use lethal injection if the inmate refuses to make a choice. So um, the General Assembly tried to pass a bill, or they did pass a bill, allowing the state to choose the electric chair as its method of execution. But rather than sign that, McAuliffe amended it, I think this is a line item veto, to allow state officials to obtain execution drugs made by compounding pharmacies in secret. McAuliffe does support capital punishment. 
you want to make sure that we can do the death penalty without resorting to the electric chair. I mean, if you're going to be in capital punishment, I mean, the electric chair is horrible, I'm sure. But uh, based on some of the one of the one of the last guys to get this drug cocktail uh, didn't sound like it was uh, that good either. There we go. In two of the box executions using the drug, Joseph Wood in Arizona in 2014 and Dennis McGuire in Ohio 2015. The botched execution of Clayton Lockett in April 2014. In all three cases, the condemned man appeared at first to be unconscious, then gasped for air or struggled in pain. Because the drugs are manufactured by compounding pharmacies, they don't have a way to gauge the strength of the drug and are unable to maintain the anesthesia. So you apparently you put the person to sleep, they're supposed to feel no pain, and then you kill them. Uh, but because of the way the drug has been administered, they wake up in the middle of it, apparently. Or not all the way. But again, you know, we'll leave the capital punishment argument for the comments. I can't really say whether I'm for it or against it. I'm probably more against it than I am for it. But the question of how does society deal with the worst among them, I'm a bit conflicted on that myself. So I'd like to know what you think. Let me know. And as usual, we would like to end the show on a positive note. So let's have our fame for the week. different not sure who to give it to this week there's a couple candidates i'd like to talk about and let you guys decide uh first up dan casey metro columnist from the roanoke times i love his byline or his bio it says uh dan casey knows a little bit about a lot of things but not a heck of a lot about most things <laughs> guess that would go for me too but uh he wrote a an editorial about the nra survey that came through calls it a bunch of malarkey i'll let you check it out on the Renault Times website. Second item up is Governor Kane, or excuse me, Lieutenant Kane. <laughs> Take three. Senator Kane pressures Senate colleagues and Trump for authorized war against Islamic State. So the basic premise of this is that the war powers, the declaration, the power to declare war lies with Congress. They don't want it. They would rather let the president do what they want rather than have their name attached to a bill or a war that is seen as unpopular. It's a political suicide. Anyways, Kane, to his credit, has been trying to get Congress to take responsibility by authorizing the use of force for ISIS in the Middle East. And he didn't he didn't get it done last year when he tried to do it. And he's trying to do it again on his first floor speech since uh, he lost the election with Hillary Clinton, urging Congress to authorize military force. So kudos to him. And then the last fame we want to hand out is for Bruce Smith, who is a NFL Hall of Famer. But he held a news conference Monday morning in a parking lot in Rudy Inlet here in Virginia Beach, claiming that the mayor, Will Sussums, excuse me, uh, I'll just read from the article in Pilot. Smith said he and a group of businessmen, who he declined to name, would be willing to pay half the cost of a racial disparity study on how city contracts are awarded. Quote, Mayor Sussums refused to initiate a science-based study, perhaps out of fear of inequalities the study would reveal. Um, Smith, a real estate developer and investor, first raised concerns of racial inequality and cronyism last week in a letter addressed to Sessions and sent to state, sent to dozens of legislators and officials in Virginia Beach and around the state. In the letter, Smith detailed roadblocks he said has faced he has faced as an American African American businessman trying to develop properties at the oceanfront. Sessoms, after reading the letter, said the city is open to African American developers and businesses, and there was no need for a study. Other council members could still 
call for one, but so far none have. So kudos to him for standing up for that, and we'll see where that goes. But anyways, that's all the time we've got for the week. I appreciate everyone that's tuned in and listened to my horrible voice for today. Thankfully, I haven't coughed or hacked. Hopefully, no sniffling this week. I figured out how to use the noise gate, so that'll cut down on all the breathing. Um, every week, we get better. So we're going to keep doing it as long as we can. With your support, we'll keep doing it. I'd like to thank you for your support and all your shares. So please check us out on our website, share us on social media, and your financial support is always appreciated. This is the For Virginia Podcast, episode 15. Please submit your feedback on our website, on Facebook, or by emailing info at forvirginia.org. We'll continue working hard to bring you the news, information, and analysis to help keep the progressive revolution moving forward in Virginia through 2017 and beyond. My name is Michael Brennan Wade. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.